Hey, it's Dr. Zen. Congratulations to all of you who have been working with my suture videos. Uh, I love your comments and tell me how successful you've been at suturing and how much it's helped you. That's awesome. I've had a lot of questions uh, from many of you as to, great, I know how to suture, but how do I pick the suture? So this is a, a little presentation I have for you that talks about suture material. I've given this, this particular talk to surgeons, uh, to groups of students, and it's always amazing that people don't really understand the suture material itself. Oftentimes, people just use the suture that someone showed them to use or what was on the shelf. So I'm hoping you're going to learn a lot uh, from this. And at the very end, I'm going to give you my tips as a plastic surgeon, uh, what I think are the best sutures. And so we're going to go ahead and proceed with choosing the right suture material. So our objectives uh, for this presentation and for my talk with you is going to be talking about not only the composition and the characteristics of the different sutures, uh, but also then, like, how do you actually then make a decision based on those characteristics? So we're going to start really basic. Some of you, this may be review. Uh, if you're a surgeon, uh, certainly you'll know a lot of this already, but I think you'll hopefully learn a lot. And if you're just getting started, we're going to start pretty basic. Suture comes as really two varieties. Uh, it can be a braided suture made up of a lot of little fibers that are braided together, or it can be a monofilament, meaning just one thread. And when you look at a suture and feel it in your hand, it's all going to feel like it's just one thread. So this is really almost at a you know, microscopic level sometimes, and it's hard to tell whether it's actually braided or not. So let's talk about braided suture. So why would you want a braided suture versus a monofilament? Well, braided sutures, you can imagine, are these small little fibers twisted together. And we know through physics that by doing that and by having these uh, little materials braided, that actually gives the suture more strength. We call that the tensile strength. Also, like a braided, like anything we see that's braided, they're also softer. It's more pliable. And so that's very enviable when we're suturing to not have suture that's super stiff, uh, that it'll be nice and soft when we're using it. The other thing that's nice is when you take a braided suture and after you've passed your suture and now you're tying your knot, that knot itself will stick better. The material tends to hug uh, because of the braided nature of it, tends to hug itself. And so you'll see when you're tying knots, Generally, when I am suturing down and tying knots, I do three sort of square throws, like I showed you in the video, and that's usually perfect. Um, sometimes you'll find with monofilaments, because it doesn't have that same sort of stickiness to it, you'll need to put either four different throws or even more. So you often hear this term memory as well. Uh, sometimes you'll pull suture out of the pack, and this is true of monofilament, where it literally stays like it's still in the pack, and you're trying to straighten it out, and as you're suturing, it's getting in your way. Uh, you see that less with braided material. That's more a characteristic of a, a monofilament. Well, I just told you why braided suture is so great. Why would you want a monofilament then? Well, a monofilament, as you can imagine, it's just one material going through. There's no braid to it. Um, because of that, it's super smooth. And as you pass a needle through, you should be able to tell the difference uh, whether it's braided or not because it moves so easily through the tissue. So that's a huge advantage. Um, Although sutures can tie down easily, there is that sort of slipperiness to it. And you need to be careful because it tends to be a little more brittle, less pliable than a braided suture. I often see beginners, as they're picking up their suture and grabbing it, they're using the needle driver to actually pick up the suture material. And if you look at that material where you've grabbed the clamp, you've actually now broken the suture a little bit or dented it. And you'll find while you're suturing that sometimes the suture just breaks out of nowhere. And that's because you actually grabbed it and caused that little deformity to it. So it's a disadvantage, but once you learn this, uh, it's, it's a nice smooth suture. So it's, it's one of the most common ones that we would use for things like skin closures. And we'll go over that a little more detailed. The other sort of big difference between stitches are those that are absorbable or will dissolve versus non-absorbable or permanent suture. So absorbable sutures, there's basically two varieties. Um, there's some older, older school sutures, uh, sutures that are uh, made from uh, natural materials. And when they're inside the body, the way that they get dissolved or absorbed is through certain enzymes that are present in your tissues. So there's really an enzymatic process to break them down. Now, that's not true of most modern suture material. Uh, that's more of a synthetic material. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more detail about that because those are the sutures that we generally will use those are broken down by a process called hydrolysis. So they don't require any specific enzymes. It's just a reaction with water. And they'll you know, start with a certain strength. And just by having contact with tissue will break down over time. So 
why would we want a suture that disappears? Well, if you think about it, um, you don't need to have a stitch there all the time for the rest of time, right? So we need stitches to hold tissue together wherever we're trying to get a wound to heal. And once it's healed and has strength, you theoretically don't need that anymore. So ideally, a stitch that was placed holding things together, if it disappeared later, would be better. And actually, we see this in general surgery and other surgeries that we do where we put permanent stitches inside the body. The problem with a permanent stitch is it never dissolves, it's always there, and rarely, like bacteria that generally naturally circulate through your body, if they actually land and get to this material, they can actually form an infection. And it turns out your body can't really fight infection into foreign bodies because there's no way for the, your, your inflammatory cells or your immune system to get in there. So sometimes we actually have to reoperate on people to go and get those stitches. So there's definitely an advantage if, if something can disappear over time. Um, I can tell you also, this is the type of suture that everybody asks for. Anytime someone cuts themselves or we're suturing something up, they're going, you're gonna use dissolving stitches, aren't you? And it's funny because I probably am not gonna use dissolving stitches most of the time, and we'll talk about that. So they are certainly more popular. When we talk about a permanent suture, well, what's the advantage of that? It really is that the stitch itself is gonna have more strength than an absorbable suture. A dissolving suture will have strength that disappears over time. A non-absorbable suture is just going to have the same strength all the time. And that's really important when you want something to stay closed. You want the wounds to stay together. So it's even better in cases where maybe it's injury or surgery where we sutured something and now the next couple of days things are going to get swollen. That swelling will pull on your stitches and so certainly a permanent stitch can tolerate that uh, swelling better. So we'll do that in big trauma cases, for example, where we know there's going to be a lot of swelling. The other thing that's interesting is that these materials that we use, these permanent sutures, the body just doesn't react to them very much. So if you put a dissolving stitch in the skin for closing the skin, you actually may get a really big inflammatory response. You'll get a lot of redness around the stitches because the body is trying to absorb it. So although you don't have to remove it, that might be an advantage. You're also going to get a scar that may have these little red marks around it or a really red scar, which is not what nobody wants. So you'll see for permanent stitches, there's very little reactivity. So you can leave them in for three or four days. For some cosmetic cases, I'll leave them in for two or three weeks and you just don't get a lot of redness to them. And they're holding the wound together as long as you want and then you're taking them out. So actually I've placed it, I wrote here that better for kids because you know the biggest mistake I see people in the emergency room, when people are sewing up kids, they're kind of fighting, they, hurt, they had a cut in their face and you're trying to suture something up. Number one, the dissolving stitch may not hold long enough. So it may be a day or two later and they come back and things have broken open. And number two, you're gonna get the worst possible scar because you're getting all this reactivity. Ideally, I would prefer to put a permanent monofilament stitch and there's not gonna be a lot of reactivity and we'll struggle a couple days later in taking the stitches out. Any of my facial cosmetic cases, this is what I use because we want the best possible scar. So a couple of things we need to talk about for suture material, there's something called the tensile strength. So that's the actual strength of the suture that it can hold before it breaks. And so that's a measurement that's uh, done by the United States Pharmacopeia, uh, and it's how we compare different suture materials. We also talk about an absorption profile for sutures that are dissolving because, you know, there's a certain amount of time when a suture is placed in the body, it has 100% of its strength, and then literally immediately it starts losing its strength as we have that uh, reaction, either enzymatic or hydrolysis. And so what we'll see is it'll have the, the amount of strength that we need to hold the wound together, and then as it starts to go away, we'll see a little bit of coming apart or something that's not as strong anymore. So this is a, a characteristic that actually is super important. And we talk about failure, so when a wound is gonna come apart, it can be a failure of the suture, but it also can be a failure of the knot. So how we tie our knots, super important. We've talked about squaring the knots uh, in the video, and that's like really important. So the knots are, are snug and will stay tied longer. Um, but also the different type of suture material can affect how effective those knots are, whether it weakens the suture or whether it allows those knots to lay down beautifully. So you'll find that a braided suture just generally has a little more friction to it. So if you try to use it over and over again, you'll see that it's not gonna be as strong. Um, we also see that we like to use different diameters of sutures. So sutures that are really, really super thick, the knot can stay on longer, but then it's a lot of uh, absorbing that has to happen and a lot of dissolving. And you'll see for like plastic surgeons and for like facial things, we use smaller and thinner and thinner suture. 
And so we have to then think about the strength uh, and how those knots are going to tie down for this tiny little suture because it can break. So it's interesting if you look at studies that have looked at sort of when wounds come apart, almost always where it comes apart is at the knot itself. So your, your technique of tying the knot is super important. And also we talked about even when you're using your instrument not to be tying a knot in a place where you maybe have damaged the suture material. I love this slide. This is always surprising to people. People will, will email me and ask, hey, is it okay to use a 3-0 suture for this? Or I want to use a zero. Like, it's interesting to know what those actual numbers mean. So you think about suturing has been around for a long time, you know, 17, 1800s, probably even longer before that. But as it was being made industrially, you know, the smallest suture made uh, was called a zero. And then every time a stronger suture was made and a bigger suture was made, it was then given a larger number. So a number one suture, bigger than a zero, number two, bigger than number one, et cetera. And suture sizing goes all the way up to a number seven. As manufacturing got better, and as we started using finer and finer sutures because we get actually get better results sometimes, especially cosmetic results using very, very little suture material, we wanted thinner and thinner suture. And so once we made something smaller than a zero, rather than changing the whole uh, classification, they decided, well, let's just call it a double zero. And they're great. And then you made smaller than that, and it's like, well, we'll call that one a triple zero. And you can see from the chart, we're up to like 11 zeros, and it gets really confusing to have like a string of all these zeros. So we just simply refer to these as 2-0, 3-0, 4-0. -0. I think for the beginner or the novice, it's confusing because you would think a 4-0 is bigger than a 3-0, because 4 is bigger than 3. So anytime it has the dash and the O, it's actually heading the different, the, the different direction. And I've placed here, get a sense of suture sizes. You think about the human hair. That's about a 7-0. And so we'll use 7-0 uh, in some vascular applications. It's a common stitch that's used for coronary artery bypass grafting. You can see generally for the strength that we would need for a skin closure is somewhere between the 3-0 to 5-0 to 6-0 range. Uh, you can see for some of these really large sutures, they're for big abdominal like muscular closures or even like trying to close ribs in the chest. But we will, you know, you do microsurgery, which is using a, a microscope to do the surgery and I can hold up uh, a 10-0 suture to you and you won't even see the needle and you won't even see the suture. They're so small. Only under a, a highly magnified field can you see this. So microsurgery is done at a very small level. And we'll do that for things like reconnecting tissues when people have digits amputated, sewing everything back together, reattaching ears, things like that. So that explains the uh, numbering system. This is a busy chart. Uh, I guess what I wanted you to take away from this chart was if you look sort of at the far left on top, there are some just naturally occurring uh, suture and naturally occurring materials that sutures are made out of. Uh, those are uh, the absorbable natural sutures. And the next column over is you see the synthetic sutures. And synthetic sutures can be absorbable or they can be permanent, right? And so the beauty of that is that you can make a suture with the characteristics that you want. And the other thing I wanted to show you in this uh, in this slide here is if you look at the bottom that you take a suture like a vicral suture which is an absorbable suture that at different periods of time they're going to have different levels of strength and so if you ideally want at least 65 percent of the strength to kind of hold the wound together if you look at the vicral suture you can see at three days versus seven days versus two weeks you're going to continue to lose uh, strength and I can tell you, I've reoperated on patients where it says that, you know, it should be completely absorbed uh, by a, two months, three months, and it's two years, three years later, and there could still be some material there. So, you know, it's sort of like a, a just a degradation curve. Uh, the suture material still may be there. Uh, it may have caused some scar tissue around it. It's just not strong anymore. There's another thing I wanted to point out. This is a suture card uh, that our hospitals use. Different companies make this suture, but they all make the same types of suture. So there may be four or five different suture companies. Uh, everybody makes a certain type of polysorb or vicryl, uh, the certain same components, it's exactly the same material, maybe a little bit of a different processing. And what they've done is they've kept all these suture types in the same colored packages. So if you wanted to use a vicryl and they handed you a polysorb, you'd see the package was purple. And you'd say, oh, okay, it's the same. So, you know, I know a proline or a surge pro is going to be in the loop package. So you may notice this color uh, issue. I think they've made it easier so you can substitute back and forth. Maybe companies that aren't as popular can sneak in and sell you some suture too. So let's just talk about some of the more common sutures that you'll see. Uh, from the natural sutures, as I said, these aren't used uh, as much anymore. Uh, they're probably harder to make. I think a lot of surgeons are older. 
Um, they've kind of done it this way their whole careers, and they just like using the suture that they use. So surgical gut uh, is a very commonly used suture. Uh, it's called gut because it literally is made from small intestine, from cow small intestine. Uh, it can be treated uh, with an aldehyde, so this, it feels, when you feel it, it feels like just a single monofilament, but actually uh, it has certain strand quality uh, to it. Uh, this suture is very temperamental because it's made of these natural materials, so it breaks pretty easily. Uh, I've seen it used still today when people will like do bowel anastomoses and things in the body where they just want to reattach the mucosa part, the inside part of the intestine. There's no tension on it, they just kind of want to hold it together and they want a lot of reactivity, so there's some scarring that helps the healing. You'll get a lot of scarring. If you put a, a plain gut uh, in the skin, uh, you'll see it gets pretty red pretty quickly too. So it doesn't really, it's not ideal for a lot of skin uh, applications. Chromic gut has simply just been treated uh, differently. It's treated with a chromium solution, so it lasts longer. So what we see then is if we look at strength, uh, a plain gut, because it's not as treated as a chromic gut, it's not going to have its tensile strength as long. Generally, it's for a few days up to a week, so here we say seven to ten days. Whereas by having this extra process, this chromic gut can last closer to two weeks. And more importantly, you know, the plain gut will disappear faster. Uh, the chromic has been treated to hang around longer. So that goes to the absorption profile. More interesting is really the more modern sutures. And these are the ones that you're going to use more often. So the synthetic, synthetic suture, interestingly, uh, all the sutures share common building blocks. So there are certain monomers that are used to build sutures. And each of the monomers you can see uh, in the chart here on the left side have different characteristics. And if you made an entire suture of glycolide, you may have really, really great strength. It has high strength, but also uh, it disappears really quickly. It hydrolyzes quickly, you know, and the problem is it's not flexible at all. So it'd be a very stiff suture that would have good strength, but it'd disappear really quickly. So really what you want to do is you want to try to mix these different monomers in ways that give you sutures that have different characteristics that are stronger longer, maybe disappear faster, they feel better in the hand. So what you'll see is that when you look at sutures that are commonly used, um, there are different combinations uh, of each of these. And that's how synthetic sutures are made. And that's kind of how they get their different characteristics. So we can see here some of the more common uh, sutures. And I'm going to actually go through some of these because I think it's helpful uh, to think about, again, how you're going to pick your suture. So if we look at sutures that are absorbable and are braided, um, these are ideal because they handle well, they have nice flexibility, they're going to disappear, so you're not going to have them permanently. So that I think they're great personally for like under the skin where we're trying to pull things together. Um, ideally, you need a good solid two weeks of things together before you know, the natural uh, healing and natural scarring process has good strength to a wound, so something that holds tensile strength for about three weeks is ideal. So Polyzorb or Vicryl is the other company's name. is perfect for this, and you'll see this. I'll use this deeply to get the skin together, untie knots. Like I said, even though at three weeks it loses its strength, it can still be around uh, for a fair amount of time, as you see, up to 70 days. Um, the next uh, sutures are also absorbable, but these are the monofilaments. Uh, again, so monofilaments have better handling characteristics through skin, so I like these better uh, in the skin themselves. Um, Capricin is something that's very fast dissolving. It has the same uh, sort of tensile strength as plain gut, if you remember, about 10 days. The beauty of these synthetic sutures, and I place them in the skin sometimes just to realign the skin perfectly, is that they kind of just disappear after a week. Hydrolysis has taken away that little internal part of the suture and just kind of falls off, and there's no real redness to it. So you don't get as much, as much reactivity as we do with the natural sutures. Uh, biosin is a great suture for running the subcuticular uh, closure. I know a lot of you have commented that that's kind of the coolest closure that we can do. It's also the one that has no suture material that's visible in a scar, so it is a very cosmetic uh, closure. Uh, that literally sits under the dermis, holds the skin together. Again, it has, again, about that three-week time frame, which is actually perfect uh, for healing wounds. And then sometimes you need something that's a little stronger, so then you might choose a Maxon, maybe because it has twice as long uh, tensile strength and can have good strength. And that might be in a situation where maybe it's uh, a weight-bearing surface or a joint or somewhere where there's going to be a lot of swelling or there's injury and you just want to have that strength for a little bit longer. So there's reasons to choose these. Um, some of the non-absorbable sutures, silk, again, is kind of one of these old-school sutures, but you'll see it around everywhere because it just works so well. I mean, it, uh, it has a great feel to it because um, it feels good in your hand and has good strength. This is the suture I love for like medical students and people learning to, to suture um, just because 
Uh, it ties knots, it holds the knot really well. If you're pulling it too hard or doing too much, you're not going to break it uh, as much. Um, so it has great uh, handling characteristics. I still use this really for drains and things like that where I know it's going to come out anyway and it's just really easy to tie. Probably more commonly though, you're going to see uh, two sutures. The first uh, is nylon suture, so it's literally made of nylon material. It's monofilament, so it moves through the skin really, really well. This is the suture that has great strength to it. It's not going to have a lot of reactivity, so this is going to be a primary suture for closing the skin. And you think about the different types of techniques I've taught you, whether it's a simple or a simple running or a mattress suture, you're going to be using something like a nylon suture because you know you're going to be taking it out and it's going to retain that strength for it. Um, nylon comes in a braided variety, but honestly, I don't, it doesn't change the strength characteristics, so I don't know why people uh, use it honestly. I think you're going to use pretty much just this monofilament that's not braided. So nylon is one. The other is a, a proline or poly polypropylene, which is Surge Pro. Um, also, it's a monofilament. It's synthetic. It's going to be there forever. It's a little reactivity. Honestly, the difference between these is one is black and one is blue. It's kind of the way I lay it out for patients. If I'm putting stitches on their face, I was like, do you want blue or do you want black? And uh, characteristics otherwise are the same. So um, again, this is going to be the most common suture that you'd use for stitching up skin. And you can make these sutures super, super strong. So there's applications in the chest where we used to use, literally used to use wire to bring things together because it's such good, durable strength. So Tychron is one of these sutures. It's a polyester. So it's incredibly strong. It's not going anywhere. Uh, it's great for a deeper applications inside the body where you just need something that's going to be there forever and, and have great strength. So before we finish, um, I did want to talk about needles as well, because when you pick up a package of suture, what you'll see is there's a lot of different choices. And if you think about the needle, there is sort of the pointy end, the point of the needle. There is sort of the body uh, of the needle, and there's the swedge. And the swedge is where the suture material is going to be attached to the needle. Now, I told you in the, in the suture videos, the place that you always want to grab the needle with your needle driver is the middle, is that body. Needles generally are going to be flat in that area, and it makes it nice and secure. If you grab it up by the swedge, it's a rounded area. Not only will the needle move, uh, you can also just accidentally, the suture material can come out of the needle, and then you've got to start all over again. Definitely don't want to grab a needle by the point. And I see this a lot in beginners as you're passing a suture, the point comes through and you kind of grab it because it dulls the point. So the basic difference, I guess, that I would want you to know in the tip of the needle is that there are cutting and taper. Taper, obviously, by its name, is a smoother taper to it. A cutting actually has a sharp cutting edge to it. So if you're, if you're suturing in skin and you're going to use the stitch over and over again, you definitely want a cutting needle. A taper needle will be good for the first pass or two, and then you'll find out it's just hard to get through. Taper needles are often used more under the skin for deeper tissues, for things like bowel and muscle and things like that. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your needles. So in conclusion, if you think about what our goals were for this talk, we wanted to talk about the composition uh, of our suture material, the characteristics, to give you a better sense of which suture you should be choosing. And now the sort of million dollar question is, so which suture should I use? For what? So I know that's frustrating for you. What I'm going to tell you is that surgery is an art. So there is no exact right answer. You will see uh, people use different things. If you, had, if you could think of the ideal suture, it would, again, hold material together that you wanted, tissue to tissue, so it could heal and be strong. And once there was enough strength in that healing process, you would want that suture to disappear. And so that's the ideal. And as you saw from the characteristics of the sutures that we have, like none of those are really going to be perfect for you. So you have to decide what you really want. And so really what we're going to highlight is for this strength is super important. And yeah, it may last a long time. It may be in the body longer, but we're going to live with that uh, if there's any issues with that. And you will see some very accomplished surgeons doing the exact same surgery or the exact same procedure and use different, different sutures. And, you know, depends what specialty they're in. Depends kind of how they were trained. And I tell you, experience is really big. There are areas where I have used a certain suture for five years in a row and I have a complication or a problem. And maybe something got infected or a wound came apart. Next thing you know, I go and change to something else. I go from, you know, from a monocryl nylon to a proline or a braided suture to a non-braided suture. And so we're kind of fickle that way because a lot of it probably doesn't have to do with the suture material. It's how you're suturing and your technique. 
So I would just say understand, like when you're watching someone do surgery or someone's using something, ask, say, why are you using a 3.0 nylon here? You know, Dr. So-and-so uses a, a 4.0 proline for this. And a lot of times, don't be surprised, they don't have an answer because it's just kind of the way we've always done it. But you should think about it because you're learning now and you should be using suture material that's suture appropriate for you. So I can tell you, as a plastic surgeon, I have very sort of firm ideas about what you should be doing. So I'll just go ahead and tell you kind of how I feel about things. Um, certainly braided, uh, absorbable suture is ideal when you're bringing suturing skin to bring that skin together. So taking the deeper fascia or fat, or even the deeper part of the dermis, the deep part of the skin, because what we want is we want those two tissue planes together and held in place so that our final suture is not holding the skin together, it's aligning things perfectly. So like a Vicro or a Polysorb is perfect for that, three week time frame, perfect. Um, certainly when we're closing things on the face, the outer closure of the skin, uh, I've told you already, I kind of like nylon or proline for that. I think the scar is the best. Yes, I have to take the sutures out. Um, and I'm telling you, it's not a problem. So, you know, stitching things down, not overly tight, getting the skin together. If, sti if stitches start to get red, that's generally when I recommend taking them out. So if stitches in the face, I would generally say a minimum of three to four days. Uh, generally, leaving them for a week is perfectly fine. Um, so uh, what about the subcuticular that we all love so much? So a subcuticular, you, you could use a permanent stitch and leave it sticking out of the skin and pull it out. Generally what I like to do is if I'm going to do subcuticular, let's use an absorbable suture so that the patient never has to have stitches removed. Something like a monocro or a PDS, again, has about three weeks strength. Uh, the video I've shown you how you bury the knot and how you can run the suture and get a really beautiful closure. Um, but you should definitely think about, you know, larger diameter uh, monofilaments in areas that are going to bear a lot of weight and have a lot of stress to them. So you want a higher number. So you might use a 6-0 or 5-0 uh, nylon in the face. If I'm fixing a skin over a joint or an elbow, I'm going to use like a 3-0. And I might still use a nylon because I want it to be there for a while. So areas that are mobile, uh, like joints, and certainly areas where there's trauma or you expect a lot of swelling, I would never do a subcuticular. I think that's a big mistake. And believe it or not, even when like we're going to suture something up, if there's a lot of tissue damage or it's like infection or we know we may have to take these things out quickly, I won't even put stitches in. I'll just staple the skin closed. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm really excited for everybody for all the suturing that they've been doing. Please keep those comments coming. Uh, I love hearing about uh, where you've been doing suturing and how it's helped you out and other thoughts or ideas or questions that you have so we can do more helpful videos. Take care and happy suturing.